right. Hello again. Uh, I finally have the opportunity to start one of my talks with a joke because I've always wanted to, you know, I, I hate public speaking and I get nervous and my friends were always like, oh, just start with a joke. I'm like, all right, well, I'm a scientist, so I don't have jokes. I don't do laughter. But I made a friend this weekend, Janie, who told me a really great joke. And if it's okay, I'd like to steal it and share it and pass it off. So thank you. What do you call a camel with no hump? Give up? Hump free. Thank you. All right, so I was planning to, to share some data with you guys about our uh, KIF-1A stem cell models that we have. Um, but yesterday, actually, I, I talked to quite a few of you, and there was this recurring question of, what's up with the handles? And it wasn't exactly clear, and there was, you know, whether the handle was actually a handle shape, and that was affecting the specificity, and, and really great questions. But it was clear that, you know, I just kind of, I'm going to spend a little bit more time today going over that and making sure we're all caught up in and fully aware of what's going on when we're talking about the variants, the handles, SNPs, things like that. Um, and I've got a little bit of data for you. I think, you know, talking to a few of, I think we might be overdue for uh, some more research roundtables so we can really kind of just get into the science and share really deep. Um, so, so for that, sorry for the fellow scientists out there who are looking for some data. Um, but I think we're going to, we're going to focus more on some, some explanation and kind of take it back to the beginning with the ASO talk that we were uh, having in the first, or I guess if you've been here since Thursday, since yesterday. So uh, so we uh, in the Chung Lab, we, we have mouse models, we have stem cell models. The stem cells are what I'm gonna focus on today. Um, and basically what we can, we can see, I'm just, if you can see the cursor when I move, you can't, that's all right, all right. Um, and I know on that side, sorry, the screen's a little dark. But basically when you, uh, come in and you participate and you consent and you donate your blood, um, you have the option of we can make stem cells uh, from your blood. Um, you can also do this other ways, you know, a skin biopsy blood is kind of the, the least painful. Um, so what we have here is um, in the, the, the red cell in the middle, I'm not sure if the red is showing up on the screen, um, but let's say that's someone with cans, right? Those are our superheroes. Um, they donate their samples, we get stem cells out of those, and we can actually differentiate those into neurons. So we have neurons in a dish. We can also have different controls where if maybe mom and dad or a sibling, they also want to donate. And that's the top line there. That's the healthy donor. That's the unaffected. Uh, we can also have those. So then we can say in the dish, all right, well, we have this, this cell line with canned and we know what the, the variant is, the mutation. And we can say, all right, well, these cells grow this sort of way. And then we have, you know, mom and dad, you know, relative, some control. And okay, well, these kind of grow this sort of way. And I was like, all right, well, there's kind of a difference here, maybe that's attributable to canned, right? What we can also do is we can take the, uh, our superhero cells and we can do gene editing, like had Marcus had talked about prime editing, right? We can do anything, CRISPR-Cas9, and you can change that mutation to make it look more like maybe mom or dad's, right? Like so that there's no more canned in that cell line. And then you compare how that cell looks and you say, oh, okay, that kind of looks more like the mom and dad. So maybe we can attribute that to our mutation, right? So that's kind of the idea of why we're using these stem cells and why we're making them into neurons. And so for that, we're gonna, I have maybe one image uh, of actual neurons to show you, um, but we can do things like looking at how they branch out, uh, how quickly they branch out, electrophysiology, Wayne, I'm looking at you, I wanna use your system, that's really cool data. And then we can also say, all right, well, now that we know what's going on, can we fix this? Can we reverse this? Can we treat these with something that targets the RNA, the siRNA, shRNA, ASO, which should ring a bell, right? So if we're going to throw ASOs onto these, can we undo what's being done that makes these neurons different? And so this is kind of a very simplified outlook of, of what I'm doing when I'm in the lab. Um, I have uh, your stem cells. I have your, your you know, precious uh, superhero stem cells. Um, and what I do is I induce them into uh, a neural stem cell like uh, fate where they're kind of primed to become neurons. Um, and then it's, it's really just either um, there's a bunch of ways to do it. And again, you know, we'll, we'll talk protocols offline, whether NGN2 or, you know, adding astrocytes or, you know, Gibco chemical induction. Um, but basically you can, and you can look at them, you know, in a dish and then every week kind of map out how they're growing, how they're branching out. 
Um, and so you can compare all your different lines and, and genotypes and isogenic controls, et cetera. So that's, that's basically what we're doing here. Um, so this is more of a, you don't need to focus on this, but this is kind of just proof of concept. When I say I'm making neurons, I'm really, is, yeah, I'm making neurons, right? Um, so these are at the NSL, uh, NSC stage, that's the neural stem cell. Um, they're going to express certain markers that in the science community, we're going to say, okay, well, if they, you know, check these boxes, they're probably neural stem cells. So, okay, you pass quality control. Let's move on from that. And that's all that is really, uh, you don't have to focus on that. Um, so now here we've actually got some neurons. So this is pretty cool. These are our neurons from uh, people either in this room or are listening online from our community. Um, we've got on the, the leftmost box here, if that's showing up, uh, our control. So that's uh, uh, a cell line that does not have any KIF1A mutation in it. We've got the R203S, the E253K, and the P305L. Um, and you can kind of tell by eye, maybe, maybe not, maybe it's just me because I've been staring at these for hours on end, um, that some of them look a little bit shorter than the controls. Um, so when we uh, take these, we look in the microscope, we have uh, the software and we can we can count and measure and, and see how long these these branches actually go. Uh, and so what we do is we quantify, right? So then we get an actual number, a measurement, and we, then we can really compare and then we can run statistical analysis and we can see what's going on. Um, so here's just an example of when you compare your, uh, your canned lines to the control um, that what we're seeing in, in these specific ones, uh, and this is at the four week time point. I know there was a, a great talk from the Silverman lab about, uh, I think it was like a week in um, and there's really no difference. And that's basically what we see. So we have to wait until at least week four uh, before we see this, um, where the, the, the branches are shorter than the controls. So we basically, we have a, a, what you'd call a phenotype, right? There's something we can actually look at and say, okay, here's a difference. This is, this is a marker for us to look at and if we're going to change anything, we can use that to gauge if the change is actually successful, if it's happening for treating them. Um, and I, I think that's basically what I just said here. I don't need to read off the actual slide. Um, but so the next step is, can we treat the neurons? And that's where we kind of start moving into the, the ASO portion, right? So we all have DNA. We all have RNA, which is made off of that DNA sequence, right? So you get your genetic report back. You've got this CAN mutation, that's your DNA, and you're going to use that to make your RNA. The DNA is more, um, you know, permanent. That's what it is. Uh, the RNA is more of a transient. It's, it's going to be instructions to make protein. And so that RNA, you can see in that middle part, is going to be made to, uh, used to make uh, your kif one protein. So on the left here, we've got two copies because we all have two copies, right? Um, one from mom, one from dad. Uh, and that's going to make the, uh, as wild type, you know, someone mentioned before wild type normal. Um, I like to think of, you know, like if you're, uh, on the subway, right. Cause I'm in New York and you just pull a rat off the subway. That's, that's in the wild. That's wild type. That's normal. That's what you would expect versus what you're growing in the lab. Um, and so that's what you've got on the left here. Now on the right, you can see with that little lightning bolt, that's the causative mutation. That's what's causing can in our kids. And you've got on the left there, the, the blue or the black, however, it's showing up, um, that healthy wild type, you're still going to make that wild type protein, but then you're also going to be making that canned version uh, of the kif one protein, right? Uh, and so that's the red. And, and we know that basically, um, I think I'm missing a slide here, but that one copy uh, of the, the canned version is enough uh, to kind of gunk up that that motor, that processivity that we've been talking about and hearing about so much. Um, and so we want to talk about instead of, you know, because you don't really want to go in and, well, you do, like eventually, right? Like gene, gene therapy, but because we're not there yet, what's another way to do it? We could target the RNA. We could target the instructions for the protein and we can say, okay, let's just stop it there and we'll only have the wild type, right? That'd be pretty nice. So there's a few ways to do it. I'm not really going to get into it because, again, I think Marcus put it great. You don't need to know. It doesn't matter. Like, if you want to look it up, you can. But for the purpose of this, uh, you know, you've already seen Susan's data, right? So the ASO, that's the way we're pretty much going to go with this. It's been working great. Um, but I just kind of wanted to put this out there just so in case you're curious, these are the differences when I talk about these things. Because in our lab, uh, I have looked at all three uh, modalities of, of knocking out the RNA, knocking down the RNA and looking at this. So again, you've got the DNA up there. That, pro that proceeds down to RNA. If we block it at that point, then you're not going to get those uh, instructions to make that protein, right? So that's that's the thought behind this. So here's some actual data now, uh, and this is uh, some of the early days when we started with the siRNA, um, and the siRNA is 
is is more transient. So really, you kind of just you put it on the cells, you harvest them, and then you do the analysis, right? So this isn't going to be made in the cells. This is something you're applying to the cells. Uh, and what we've got here is uh, if you look at the very left uh, two columns, so where it says control, right? That's that's our control. Um, the gray or black bar that is the wild type allele. Um, and for those, you know, again, protocols will talk like qPCR, next generation sequencing. There's some easy ways to look at this. Um, and then we have uh, lamina, which is just a control. And then we've got our candidates. So we've got this target for the p305 mutation, right? So I'm targeting this specifically, but I'm kind of walking out different designs. So there's different subtle changes in the sequence of the siRNA. So these are technically different candidates, but they're all targeting the same spot in the KIF1A gene. Uh, and we can see that each of these different candidates has a slightly different effect. So, you know, the, the first one here, the 71, we're getting, you know, a quarter of a knockdown for the mutant. We're also getting a, a quarter knockdown for the wild type. Mm, not really that great. If you go all the way to the end, you're getting much more knockdown of that mutant allele. You're getting much less knockdown of the wild type allele. That's kind of something where we want to go. So we get empirical data from tests like these. Um, and we go back to the drawing board, design, 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 test again, and we just rinse and repeat and try to hone in and see if we have some good sequences to, to target these mutations. And then so uh, in addition to siRNA, we've looked at shRNA. So then this we use with uh, a lentiviral vector. So this we're actually infecting the cells uh, and they're expressing this. So this is going to be uh, less transient, right, more stable. And uh, this is actually a pretty cool slide here because now I showed you before the um, at least this is in P305L, those cells were slightly shorter than the control, right? If you remember, those branches were a little bit shorter. Um, it might be hard to see on that side of the room. I'm sorry. Um, but basically, when we, ex uh, when we expose these cells to the shRNA and we knock down that mutant protein, that's actually enough to rescue that phenotype and our branches are getting nice and long like they were with the control. So that's pretty cool. That's encouraging, right? Um, but again, we're not really, at least not anytime soon, I don't think we don't have plans on, on putting lentiviral vectors in our kids. So, but in terms of, you know, informing the therapeutics, that was very useful. Um, so now another way we can do this is instead of targeting, let's say P305 directly, can we target multiple variants? And that this is kind of where I'm going to go back into the ASO and the, the handles to get you guys kind of make sure we're on the same page. So here we've got an example, and shout out to Betsy because we were we were drawing this on like a, a paper or a napkin or something, trying to trying to figure out how best to explain this. Um, this is let's just say the the two squiggles are the canned uh, kif one a gene. Sorry, right? And the the red one is the uh, allele that expresses the mutation, so that's going to be causing canned. Uh, the blue one or the black one on the bottom, just wild type. That's the healthy copy. In this individual. We've got, as you can see on the left, that puzzle piece, uh, that mutation is causing the P305L variant. So for that individual, like with the stuff I showed, I would use the ASO targeting that P305. So that puzzle piece, same shape, but really the same color because the next slides are all the same shape. I just changed the color. The green is gonna correspond to the green. And so that's gonna target it. We have another individual. And again, we've seen this uh, variant come up a few times. The R316W. So what are we going to do? We're going to design an ASO, and again, same shape, but it's blue, which corresponds to the blue, and that's going to target that variant. R254W, same thing. We've got this orange configuration here. We're going to get an ASO for that orange configuration. Put it there. Now, this is going to be a bit dramatic because obviously we can do things in parallel, but just for the sake of you know imagination, it took us maybe, let's say, a year to get Suze's development, uh, uh, drug development, right? So we've got over a hundred variants. If we spent one year per variant, it would take over a hundred years to get everybody. I know I like to be in lab a lot, but I don't have that kind of time. So this isn't really feasible. So what we're trying to think of is, is there a way we can sort of grab onto, you know, like, like with a handle and grab onto multiple patients at once, right? And so here's where the, the handle idea comes in. And I think I have to do a little bit of, of background explaining to, to just get us up to here. Because when you say variants, right, we're always thinking the canned variant, right? That, that what's causing the, the, the disease, the mutation. But there's something else going on. So all, in all of our DNA, 
we've got these variants and they don't necessarily have to cause a disease, right? Um, and they're called, they're referred to as SNPs. So if you wanna Google something, SNP is a good one to start with. Uh, single nucleotide polymorphism. And like, what is that? It's single, so it's one, right? Nucleotide is, is basically just think of it as um, a unit of DNA and then polymorphism, it's a change. So it's a single change in your DNA, but it's not a change that's going to change the protein structure. So it's kind of, it's silent in a way. You're, you're safe when you have it, it's benign. And we have a lot of these actually, because as our cells divide, we can you know, accumulate these over a lifetime. And it's just, it's just how it is, right? We're all unique. It's like, it's basically a fingerprint for your DNA and it's completely harmless. We've all got these, right? So there's nothing to, to shy away from. SNPs, they're cool. Now, if you've ever seen, see, I was trying to figure out, you know, how to get to the parents on here. Like if you've seen CSI or something or a crime show and they've got the DNA and they've got to link it to the, the perp, right? What's going to happen? They can actually look at the DNA in terms of variation. So they look at the SNPs and they say, okay, so we've got on the first line here, uh, we've got this variant. So pretend this is just a gene for argument's sake. And this is the, the beginning of the gene. Like, okay, there's a variant here. Suspect one, okay, they got a variant. Suspect two, variant three. Okay, so they have all shared that same variant, which is possible because we all share a lot of same variants, probably. You go to the next set of SNPs. Okay, suspect one has it. Suspect two doesn't. That DNA doesn't match. Throw them out. Suspect three has that second SNP. Now we move on to that third line. Suspect one, not a match. Throw them out. And then you keep going for suspect three. And sure enough, okay, it's a match. Now, if suspect four walks in and he's got the same DNA, all right, we've got to get another set of variants to look at. But that's the idea, right? And I, I said, you know, multiple people can have the same SNP, and we've all got a lot of SNPs. This includes the KIF1A gene. So now go back to the puzzle pieces. So KIF1A, that gene, you've probably got some variants in your KIF1A gene. Is it going to cause canned? It doesn't look like it, right? And it's just there, and it's okay, and it's normal. So I gave it a happy face, so we know that it's okay. And this is going to be the, uh, the puzzle piece that says SNP. And even though it's not causing a disease, we can still target it because that sequence is different. It's identifiable. So we add an, SA, an ASO, which targets that SNP, which targets that SNP, and we can degrade that RNA. So then that version of the protein isn't being made. So now if we have an individual with P305L and they have this happy face SNP, we can use the ASO that targets the SNP and we can degrade that RNA, which is also the same strand as the mutation causing P305L. So we're knocking down the mutation that's causing CAND, but we're really targeting something else, something downstream, something completely benign, but it's that, that sequence, that specificity, which if it's, it gives us a better hit, boom, go for that. Again, we've got someone with the uh, R316 dump, and they happen to have that same SNP. Well, guess what? That same ASO can be used to treat that person. We knock down that RNA. That protein's no longer made. Only the wild type is left. And again, I think you can see where this is going. R254W, they have the SNP. What are we going to do? We're going to put that ASO on them. We're going to knock that down. Again, hypothetically speaking, I'm not, you know. So just to kind of summarize, the idea of the handles is you can target a single SNP, which realistically will need at least a handful of different SNPs because you know we all just don't magically have that one SNP that we need. But we can do this which with much fewer candidates, much fewer therapeutics than if we were to sit there and say, go through the list, 177, you know, different, okay, boom, 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 boom. It, this makes it a lot more feasible, a lot more realistic. Um, and, it, you know, it's frankly, a lot more attractive, like when he was talking about getting funding, like, you know, if they're going to say, oh, this doesn't really, you know, fit your model, how are you going to commercialize this? Well, you know, this is actually kind of, you could do this for a company, you know, and especially I don't, like we were saying, canned, we're only finding more and more of us, you know, this is going to be our populations getting bigger and bigger, this is going to help a lot more people. Um, so really, when you when you're looking at ASOs, um, we think that this this handle approach, again, this is just kind of the handle grabs onto it regardless of what the mutation is, that might be the way to go. Uh, and then this is just so kind of similar data to what we were showing before, um, just that we can get preferential knockdown of an allele using the handle approach. Um, but again, at, at a research roundtable, I'll show you some, some really good data. I know we're running out of time. 
Um, so just to conclude, patient-derived iPSCs induce pluripotent stem cells, as we've, we've seen throughout this weekend, can differentiate into neurons. Uh, our dendrite, dendrite outgrowth uh, in our CAN cells is significantly reduced um, at the time point that we, we take them to. Uh, a little specific knockdown of canned RNA rescues that phenotype, uh, and we know that SNPs can be targeted to knock down the disease-causing alleles. Um, so with that, uh, I'd just like to thank everyone who's uh, been a part of this work. Uh, as you can see, we like to uh, we like to have fun in the Chung Lab. Uh, Wendy Chung, first and foremost, for just giving me the opportunity. Um, yeah, I mean, this has been a wild ride. Uh, I came in and uh, took over the KIF-1A stuff in 2021, uh, and it was like right when we were having that uh, that online meeting. And actually, it's it's funny because now I'm I'm seeing there's a few people who I I still have notes from their talks, and I'm I'm recognizing I'm like oh my god you're like bro hands on goal like it, it's great um, so I'm getting to nerd out a little bit um, and, but it's been really surreal and it's also it's been wild to see how far we've come right it's just ah I... it, it, yeah it really it's 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 so cool. Um, and, and for me, anyway, it would not be possible if, if Wendy Chung didn't take a chance and say, all right, I'll let you into the lab. Um, so really shout out to her. Um, I owe her so much. This has been just a fantastic opportunity. Yeah, seriously, Wendy is a powerhouse, man. That's And then everybody, really. Um, uh, the folks over at Ovid who actually, you know, they funded this work, made it possible. I guess, I don't know if that's a disclosure of mine. I should have, but Ovid, thank you. You know, we heard we heard from Pat yesterday. He, you know, it's great. Uh, and also kipwane.org. Dylan, I know this slide is probably old and needs to be updated. Um, but everyone who's who's helped out, and I know, you know, I send you guys so many emails and thanks for putting up with me and you know, last minute slides and all that, um, and giving me the opportunity to talk. This has been great. And then last but not least, certainly not least, uh, the families, all of you guys really thank you. It's <clears throat> And I, oh, actually, I remembered, I, add, I had an addition. So Sean, if you've interacted with Sean, give him a big thank you. Because I think, I think he's back at the lab now processing blood samples. He's Hello? Oh, okay. That's how it works. Yeah, no, you know, Sean is Sean is also a superhero. The guy does so much work, uh, and it's it's really a thankless job, but it it shouldn't be. So if you see him, thank him, and I'd like to personally thank Sean Calamia for everything that he's done to to make this happen because he's he's huge for us on our side of things. Oh, a ASO neurons. These are yeah. So um. I already said this before, and if anyone wasn't here for early morning, um, so I stare at this pretty much all day, every day, and these are neurons. These are, again, your neurons, um, and thank you for the opportunity. So I, Dr. Cower had mentioned like how you guys do the postcards, and you send us little thank you notes and stuff, and you give us pictures of your kids, and, and I, you know, I love it. I live for that, but I also think that we should do something periodically to kind of remind you that hey we're thinking of you we've got your back and and we're always with you so you know even if you don't hear from us and you know there's no updates I there was a gentleman I'm not going to call him out but I want to see if he's here because I yeah he's here and and I said I'm always thinking of you guys and he said yeah we're always thinking of you too and what's going on and I was like that's exactly right though because you know people like Lucas by every time he seems like oh thanks so much for what you do and it's like yeah but I also know that there's also like frustration right because this is this is really serious stuff like we're this is great this is cool but the clock's ticking and it's serious and i understand that and i guess mm, i'll share this okay so when i joined in the lab and we had our first online meeting there was there was a, a parent who gave a talk who gave it was she had lost her child and it was it was like a, a memorial video and the child was mostly nonverbal and you know non-mobile and but but she'd look up at you and she'd smile and 
the parent had shared that whenever she played this one song called uh, it's prehensile dream by the bad plus that the child would just kind of respond to it and it would just something would happen right and so after that after the talk I, I went back you know I went to my little as room Luke was saying the dark room where we look at the cells and I downloaded the song and I put it on my playlist and since then every day almost every day because sometimes you start the day with mouse work and you know sometimes you don't have to feed the cells that day they can wait the next day but almost every day that's the first song I listen to and it's a seven minute song it's pretty cool if you you know into like the jazz kind of thing and I listen to it as I'm looking at the cells and I'm thinking and I'm thinking of this this little girl and I'm just trying to imagine what it was that she was connecting to with that song how her mother felt and then I extend that and I think of the the few superheroes that I did get to meet in person I think oh how are they doing you know how was the morning were they able you know get up okay and you know, they get dressed okay I hope you know you can give the parents too hard of a time and you know doctor's appointments and what's that that's like and I'm just always thinking about you guys. I really am. And it's, it's, it's almost every day I have that song on and I, you know, it just kind of starts a thing and yeah. And then there was actually, so there was another part in that same meeting, I think. And there was another parent who had lost their child and she said something to the effect of, you know, it was, it was kind of like how to interact with bereavement and, and parents and like, you know, how do we interact? And it was, and she said something to the effect of, I don't know the, the exact words, but we don't want you to forget about our child. We want you to always talk about our child, remember our child. And that stuck with me too. And I always, I always think about them too. And, and then one more, okay. So then one more, actually one. Yeah. So this one more recently when, when we had the patient perspective talks and some of you, you know, you shared like testimonies from either you or quotes from the kids. And there was one who was talking about how hard it was. He's, he's seeing the other kids play and he can't move and he wants to have friends. And it was really hard. And then actually I saw the mom today and I said, Oh, are you so-and-so's mom? And I just want to say that really, that really, you know, it motivates me. I, you know, I think about you guys every day. And, and then she said, yeah, you know, I, I don't usually share stuff like that. And there was one time when he's on the floor and he's hitting his legs and he's saying, why won't you work? And I, that was just it for me, you know, and it, things like that, and so, you know, like, this is cool. This is fun. You know, we're doing this, but I, and, but I do understand. And, you know, part of it is like, thank you. Thank you for letting me do this research. Thank you. Thank you for trusting me with your kids' cell lines. Thank you for like having faith, but also kind of like, you know, I'm, I'm sorry. It's not today, right? Like, I'm sorry. We're not there yet, but as you've seen this whole weekend, right? Like from Wendy onward, like there's so much cool stuff happening and and we are getting there right like there and i don't say that lightly like because you know my girlfriend says oh is everything going to be okay like for whatever we're doing i'm like well i can't promise you that i wouldn't lie i don't know but we are getting there right like there's huge progress being made and this is really you know i have i have faith and so so really when i when i say thank you it's not like you know someone holds the door oh thank you like when i say thank you i really do truly mean thank you like i I can't understand how hard it is, obviously, but I, I know what some hard stuff is. So really, thank you. I, I do appreciate this. I can't, I don't know how else to explain it, but thank you. That's all. So, yeah. Oh, awesome. And then I made a few new friends this weekend. And if you were part of this game of, uh, I'll remember, I kept calling it Psycho Joe. No, Sky Joe, Sky Joe. That's what, I kept calling him Psycho Joe. But uh, yeah, special shout out to my, my new Kansas family. You guys, oh, I love you guys. Um, yeah, so thank you. And then if anyone has the photo we took on the stairs, send that to me. I, I want that, but that's, and that's that. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we have time for a few questions and then we're going to wrap up into closing statements. I'm afraid my love for individual Q&A has uh, come on to <laughs> take over the panel, uh, but we'll take a few questions. Hey, um, Michael, that was, that was fabulous. Um, so getting back to this handle yeah. ex explanation. Um, did I do a good job? Did yeah, you yeah, 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 yeah. I, I thought it, 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 I it's like, it. <laughs> um, so, so ha have you talked with any like, um, genomics groups that have large 
genomics data sets to be able to say, to look at a population of, let's say, for Alzheimer's, there's like 100,000 people sequenced. And so based on the 100,000 people, you can get like, I mean, the pun, a handle on how many are needed, how many handles are out there. Yeah, so we've, we've not so much looked at other conditions, which that's a, that's a great idea. Yeah, so we've been kind of popular, pop, yeah, pop, popular. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's, but that's, that's a great idea. Yeah, yeah. We've been focused kind of more of, of empirical. So we have someone who, this is kind of his thing, like the design aspect. So we've been just like empirically going down that rabbit hole, but that's, that's a great way to attack it. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So I actually had the same question, but as a follow on, um, would targeting SNPs handles carry higher risk of actually ending up affecting other genes in other locations? That's a great question. And that's that's going to be just like with, with gene editing, that's going to be um, sequence to sequence variation, right? So if you, if you, you know, ATG, ATG, whatever it is, and you look at that and then you map that across the genome, how many hits, if you have one base pair mismatch, you have two, where is that going to, that's just something that kind of, for each target that we end up settling on, that's, and again, that'll be like, you know, FDA conversations, the safety bomb, but absolutely, yeah, so that's, hopefully, the, the one that we go for is going to have the least amount of that, hopefully none of that, but that's, you know, again, I can't, I can't speak to that, oh, is that me, that's horrible, that's... anyway, and any other questions? <laughs> So uh, also, I loved your talk, by the way. Thank I, you. <laughs> I had a question about the statistics. So it seemed to me that uh, the mutations in uh, KIF1A that uh, cause problems are sort of selected form. So they are a smaller subset. SNPs, there's no selection. So the variety might be significantly greater. Yes. So what is the reason to think that using SNPs will get you a larger number of uh, people with one target? That's a great question. So we, so part of the new um, blood draw that you're doing is, is, is an effort to have long read sequencing done. So we're gonna start with high quality DNA. We're gonna get really good sequencing out of that. Uh, and then we can do a thing called phasing where we can basically you know, look down the entire uh, KIF1A gene for each allele and kind of map out where these SNPs are. And we've done a little bit of that because we do have some stem cell lines. Um, and so it was something like, I don't have the slide on here, but um, from four SNPs, we were able to target about 90% of our, our cohort, which was only like, uh, I think 36 to 40 people at that time. So that's kind of like, you know, we have, we have a little bit of data towards that, but that's the, the thinking that we'll be able to, at least with a handful of SNPs, grab you know, more, more chunks of the population. Yeah, thank you. That's a great question. Thank you, Janie. <laughs> Just I was sorry. Oh, another question, yeah. Uh, just wondering, when, first of all, it seems to me that to avoid damaging the the good gene, you have to make sure your handle's not on the not on the other one. Is that right? Correct, and that's part of the phasing. So, right. So let uh, the slides are gone. But yeah, so let's say that that red line, right, where the mutation was, the SNP uh, could be on that one. But now, in a patient, right, I we can, I could have two patients with R three sixteen W. One could be what we call in cis, so as the same uh, strand as the SNP, one could be on the opposite one. So that's why for every, every um, SNP locus, we're basically, we have two targets. Um, so then that's also, we have to check the efficiency of, of each of those, right? So I showed data for only one set because we were targeting the C allele, but you're absolutely right. So you, right. you have to consider both of those alleles because not everyone who has the same mutation is going to be in the same phasing, right, as those yeah. SNPs, because that's not just that's not how it works. Yeah, exactly. And the other thing is, does 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 this handle necessarily have to be on the KIF one A gene? Can oh, it be on a, on a, on adjacent gene. Can, that's a great how question. Far away so can you so, so basically, we want to keep it to the KIF one A gene because what's happening is we're targeting the the RNA, right? Um, so the instructions for down. I think you got the. Um, so we want yeah. So we want to hit it. That yeah, 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 yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, if I'm correct, when you explain the, the multiple candidates you found, or you explore to, to build a treatment, you found some candidate that will end in with a 10% less in a mutant 
protein and also 10% less in the wild type. Yeah. So you explore multiple. In the case of the Susanna treatment, what, what was the the quantity? Is was it a half of mutant? So that that's a great twice that amount. Yeah, yeah. So the, the question or... is basically, how efficient is Susan's ASO? Um, I I can't speak on that a one because probably I'm not allowed to. But two, I have no idea because they I don't know that. That's um all N Lorem's uh, data, so they they would be the ones to to share that info. I'm, I wish I could tell you. Yeah, I also wish I knew. That's yeah. thanks. <laughs> Thank you. That's a great question. So if you guys find through any of the blood you have gotten that um, one of the patients matches Suzanne's SNP, is that something you guys could potentially do with that patient, um, an ASO trial with that specific person? Right. So before I answer, I just want to preface, uh, I'm not an MD and I'm not Wendy Chung, so I'm not speaking for her, but theoretically... That that's the idea, right? So if we've got this thing that works in Sue's and it's it's targeting the the SNP that it is, then yes, if you have that, then that makes it more likely to have that conversation and take it forward. But there's still a lot more things to consider. And again, I'm not saying you know if you match, boom, you got that golden ticket. I'm not saying that, but that's theoretically the idea. Yeah. So it's the more people we have that share the SNPs that we're targeting, the easier it's going to be. Yeah. Question. This will be the last question. Also, great talk. I, we got to talk later. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Um, so I know, I know you can't share the patient's information, but I was wondering, is there a minimum like efficiency threshold that you think needs to be met in order to see the effect that you want? Just in, you know. that, That's a great question. Yeah. So in, in terms of um, the knockdown and how that's translating to, to what we're looking at in the dish, we're not really even there yet. Right now, we're just basically focusing on, on the best knockdowns. Um, it seems, from what we have, it seems like at least 50% is going to be good enough to see a difference. Um, but we still want to, you know, aim for the best. Um, because, you know, even though in the dish, you know, like the neurons are growing, um, you, you still want to know, you know, physiologically, or is can still going to be happening? Is that going to be enough? So there's a lot to, there's still a lot of work to do basically is the answer, but that's, yeah. Thank you. <laughs>